Glasgow COP26 done and another victory to us. For decades, we have manipulated governments, monopolized markets and forged agreements that keep us going, make us richer and you poorer. But how do we get here? What really happened at COP26 and how will really meet and beat these guys at this climate emergency? In the early 1990s, Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke announced Australia would cut its greenhouse emissions by 20%, using 1988 as its basis and a target date of 2005. It, this was on the background of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was held a few years before it. But in Australia, we changed our leaders quicker than our undies, and so Bob was replaced by Paul Keating in late 1991, and in the middle of a recession, momentum stalled, and Keating was defeated at the 996 election by John Howard. Under Howard's rule, he focused on the potential economic impact of climate action over inaction. These two were perhaps the turning point of climate lethargy in Australia, and what some would call the climate wars. That is, one favouring the do nothing, should be right mate, as the cost is like too great, and the other is about doing something a bit too slowly, and all of them being dictated behind the scenes by these guys. This is a theme you'll hear repeated many times in this special. In a decade of climate change becoming a mainstream thing, the Howard government did something that seems completely crazy to us now. They successfully negotiated at the 997 Kyoto Climate Change Conference, also known as COP number three, that they would set to increase Australia's emissions by 8% above 1990 levels. Increase. The rest of the world actually cut theirs. At Kyoto, the Australian delegation which was stacked by the way, with representatives from the fossil fuel industry, they demanded Australia be given a special clause to allow the inclusion of carbon emissions from land clearing. Known as the Australian Clause, it gave us an artificial head start on emission reductions. How? Because land clearing in Australia had declined sharply between 1990 and 1997, following a spike in 1990. Why? Because, well, states thought, you know what? Our soils are getting pretty bad, and water is not very good either. Soil erosion is a bad thing. So they actually cut a lot of the land clearing that had occurred. So states doing something, federal doing nothing, and benefiting from it immensely. This 8% win, or artificial starting point, was used by the government up until recently. And so, with this Australia clause in the Kyoto Agreement, what did the Howe government do? They announced the refusal to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Change of political parties from Liberal to Labor. With Kevin Rudd as Prime Minister, he ratified the Kyoto Protocol as his first act in office and attempted to set a carbon price in the form of a carbon pollution reduction scheme in 2009. But the bill failed in Parliament after members of the Liberals, Nationals and Green parties blocked it in the Senate. Fast forward to 2010 and Julia Gillard takes over as Prime Minister under her governance. A carbon price was passed into law July 2012. The funny thing, wait, no, not funny, is that carbon pricing in Australia is now routinely referred to as a carbon tax, but it needs to be more thought of as a commodity, something that can be traded and profited from. You can actually buy carbon with real money. You've got carbon offsets, carbon credits, and more. And many people benefit from this and they profit off it to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars. Right now, 21.7% of global greenhouse emissions are covered by carbon pricing. I'll talk more about this soon, but when you hear a carbon tax, know that for Australia, if we export something to countries that have a carbon tax, it costs the companies here real money to trade with that other country. And this is another missed opportunity that some fools in politics don't get. Carbon pricing can yield billions of dollars for Australia, and conveniently, side point, it decreases emissions too. Winner, winner. But getting back with these people who seem to care most about, well, economics above climate, 
a few things got in the way of a good carrot and stick policy. First, it was watered down to cover just 500 companies of the initial 1,000 that was slated for the carbon price eligibility. And weirdly, well, maybe not so weirdly, agriculture and petrol were exempt. Hmm, fossil fuel protection? You bet. In just two years since the introduction of a carbon tax, what do you suppose happened to Australia's emissions? They dropped. We're on our way, folks, nine years after the Kyoto Protocol came into effect. But along comes a wrecking ball in the, in the form of Tony Abbott, a Liberal Prime Minister who took the election a campaign with a catchy little slogan, Axe the Tax or Scrap the Tax, which some people bought ironically. Recalling your doers and fossil fuel lovers, Abbott is from Team Climate Deny, and he sold a lie to Australian voters by saying that by scrapping the carbon tax, he would save Australians 5-10% to in living costs. Did the conversation around lost billions of dollars in carbon cre credits ever get mentioned? No, of course not, don't be silly. No, they ran with the usual, we're good economic managers. They're not. And that such policies are bad for Australia because they're uncosted. But what happened when these buffoons scrapped the tax? Electricity bills went up, carbon emissions went up, and we lost out on billions of dollars in the carbon market. <laughs> yeah, good economic managers indeed. Let's all just savour this photo and burn it into our memories, shall we? Okay, moving on. Tony replaces a carbon pricing system with its direct action policy, a form of emissions reduction fund and mechanism to set industrial emission baselines. Emissions since 2014, 2015, well, surprise, surprise, they went up. But there might be a savior around the corner. Time for a new hero, one in the former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, who unlike his Neanderthal Liberal Party members, he actually supports climate action. He signed Australia to the Paris Climate Agreement in December 2015 to reduce Australia's emissions by 26 to 28% of 2005 levels by 2030. But he doesn't set any commitment for net zero emissions by 2050. Over the next two years, several significant events occur, one of which is a Finkel Review, a major report which recommends a clean energy target and proposes that Australia should commit to zero emissions not by 2050, but by 2070. Yeah, 2070 is a bit late, folks. But what does the Liberal National Party Room do? They reject Finkel's proposal and intend announce a national energy guarantee which promises to keep the lights on whilst reducing emissions between 2020 and 2030. Haha! <laughs> From what? Coal and gas? Which is neither reliable nor emission reducing? Funny stuff. So what happened under the NEG or the NEG? Carbon emissions went up, electricity prices too, and reliability, still terrible. I'll talk more about energy and tech soon, but in the meantime, you have these guys pushing their agenda, profiting more than ever, and paying no tax. And to add insult to injury, these companies not only got more than $10 billion in direct government payments, but also nearly $2 billion in fuel credits to run machines that pull coal out of the ground, which pollutes our world even more. Good one, Australian government. Tech, not taxes, right? Now, for those familiar, you may have noticed an obvious omission. Something that happened in 2015, but it actually belongs rightly here. When we, was a <laughs> that was Immigration Minister Peter Dutton with then Prime Minister Tony Abbott being overheard quipping about the plight of Pacific Island nations and them facing rising sea levels due to climate change. This contempt is not only the first time that Australia has actually used its money and influence to do as little as possible to combat climate change. No. In this revealing article by Greenpeace, they found at the Pacific Island Forum meetings in 2015, 2018 and 2019, the Australian government attempted to use its power and aid money to dilute the forum's official communique and block regional consensus on emission reductions. The Australian government blocked a Pacific region consensus on supporting a 1.5 degree warming limit at the Pacific Island Forum in the immediate months before 
COP21, that is, the Paris Climate Agreement, same year. In 2018, the Australian government objected to the wording, climate change remains the single greatest threat to the livelihood, security and well-being of the peoples of the Pacific. In 2019, the Australian government tried to coerce Pacific Island leaders into watering down the Declaration on Urgent Climate Action Now, which, according to Pacific Island leaders, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison was explicit in offering aid in exchange for diluted language in the Declaration. And it's with great joy that in May 2019, Tony Abbott lost his seat to pro-climate action independent Zali Stegall, who proposed a UK-style carbon budget legislation for Australia. Last year, Mr Angus Taylor, Minister for Emission Reductions and Energy, released the Technology Investment Roadmap and examined more than 140 technologies for potential investment between now and 2050. They include electric vehicles, biofuels, batteries, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. But importantly, it supports the continued use of fossil fuels, which by all accounts is not a way to decarbonise our world. How can a guy whose job it is to reduce emissions support fossil fuels? Easy. You dress it up as carbon capture and storage because it's a cure-all for everything, isn't it? As you can see, we've done a great job political manipulation and distortion of the energy market so that we can keep doing this. But what we don't want you to know is that most of the supposed solutions to reduce emissions are just a bunch of lies and misrepresentations. Do you really think we care about emissions? It's 2021 and by now you would have heard these terms many times. Carbon neutral, avoid emissions, carbon offsets, carbon capture and storage, and many more. But what do they mean and how do they allow coal and gas power plants to be built in an era of Paris climate agreements? First, a foundation. Carbon neutral means no net release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. A term interchange with carbon neutral is carbon offset. That allows individuals, companies and nations to support environmental projects around the world to balance out their carbon emissions. Think of net zero, carbon neutral or carbon offsets as a simple balancing act. To have electricity and most of everything that we need, it has got to be manufactured. And doing so creates CO2 going into our ecosphere because we're burning stuff. On the other hand, when we can do various things like flip the scales and either neutralize this CO2 debt or go negative. Like planting more trees that will suck up more CO2 than what we emitted when we made these things. Offsets are measured in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent or CO2e you might sometimes see. Meaning the impact of all greenhouse gases expressed in CO2 is like in a tonnage. So each ton of emissions removed by an offset creates one carbon credit. When you see offset somewhere, maybe like you offset your flight, you more than likely have paid for a carbon credit. Companies and nations, they do the same thing. They invest in carbon offset projects or buy credits from agencies that actually administer projects around the world. And it might surprise some viewers that all these companies are actively offsetting their emissions. AirBP and Ampo in particular as their fossil fuel companies. But that doesn't stop any of them emitting a truckload of CO2 into our environment. So how exactly do offsets work? At a high level, there are three main categories of carbon offsets, such as forestry and land, including forest conservation, afforestation, reforestation, and soil carbon. Examples of this might include planting of trees or native bushlands, but there are issues to this. A sketchy one is soil carbon capture. A legit method, no doubt, but in developing countries, is that land that's been actually segmented for carbon capture still there? Who is auditing it? And the plantation forest, same deal. The second category of carbon offsetting is to build a renewable energy project. Awesome. Know of like a solar or wind farm looking for investment opportunities? Brilliant. By investing it, you're more than actually buying carbon credits. These are good, high quality carbon offsets and they're easy to order year on year and projects like these don't emit CO2. And yes, to my keyboard warriors, they did during the manufacture. So maybe just rewind the video to understand CO2 debt. But the point is this, renewable energy is a fantastic tech that produces electricity we'll need for most of everything and its CO2 footprint is tiny. 
The third and most controversial category is using carbon capture or lower emission technologies. A good example of the latter is our four, no wait, three, low emission coal power plants. Termed HELI, these coal power plants qualify for Australian carbon credit units for every tonne of emission reduced. But the elephant in the room here is that these supercritical HELI units, clean coal anyone, <laughs> all the logs there, they still emit carbon. Lots of it, especially when compared to technologies like renewables. But hey, if you listen to these fools, and I highly recommend you don't, you'd believe that coal power is required, and by investing in heli, you're clean and green, aren't you? Nope, they emit 919 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour, compared to subcritical black coal that emits 1011 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour. Low emissions? <laughs> no, the difference is just 9.95% less. Coming back to this graph, renewable technologies emit from cradle to grave 67 times less CO2 compared to the cleanest coal power generation we currently have. But what tech are our politicians still supporting despite COP26? What you got happening here is our nation earning money. People overseas, they want to buy what's on there. It's a big green light for us to build more coal mines, supply the world more coal. Do you agree that COP26 sounded the death knell on coal? No, I don't believe it did. And, and for all of those who are working in that industry in Australia, they'll continue to be working in that industry for decades to come. Coal is staying for years to come? Those working in coal can rest assured that their jobs are safe? Can they, Scott? Barnaby? Matt? Let's take a look at this old tech that is coal. In Australia, there are 24 coal power plants. The Yalorn Power Station, located in Victoria, was the first built in 1890. Most coal power plants are 30 to 50 years old, and combined, they have a total power output of 24,767 megawatts, or 143.1 terawatt hours of electricity generation per year. That's roughly 54% of our energy requirements. The coal industry employs 38,000 people not 54,000 that gets bantered around a lot, and definitely not 372,000 jobs as suggested by the Queensland Resource Sector. Another fossil fuel lobby group who wants to keep the old tech going with our taxes. Now we're gonna do this the Australian way, through technology, not taxes. Wait, what? Tech, not taxes? Yet in Australia, fossil fuel subsidies reached $10.3 billion last year. Or if we actually asked them to pay their fair share of taxes, they were subsidised to the tune of $28 billion. Boy, wouldn't you like to earn $28 billion and pay no tax whatsoever? That'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Okay, so coal is Australia's predominant form of energy. It produces around 88% of generation emissions and is our greatest CO2 emitter. But what did the government and most others do at COP? Did they put an end to coal? No, India and China derailed that and they changed the wording in the final pact, terming it to phase down coal. Do our politicians love it? Uh-huh. As much as these guys want to keep it going for decades to come, will it? Is it worth keeping and is it compatible with net zero by 2050? The short answer is no. Most of our coal fleet is subcritical and these old plants are likely to be outdated and incompatible with upgrading. But thankfully, as dispatchable technologies like battery storage coupled with solar and wind are now cheaper to run than coal and gas, more on that soon, renewables are displacing old, old aging coal power plants and the Australian energy market operator estimates that Australia's 20 coal plants will actually close over the next 15 years. Does this modelling or this pamphlet have a plan? No. What will happen to those 38,000 jobs? Some will still be employed in mining and exports, but the writing is on the wall. Renewables are far cheaper than fossil fuels, and the market, not politicians, will decide what is and what isn't supported. In fairness to the fossil fuel industry, renewables actually get about $2.8 billion in subsidies per year. So perhaps what this government means by tech, not taxes, is that renewables don't need as much subsidizing compared to fossil fuel companies. Returning to offsets, the third and most dubious offset group are avoided emissions. Examples include a farmer choosing not to clear land. 
Or I could save $200,000, think CO2 debt, by not buying this Mercedes. Here's another one. To stop the spread of COVID-19, Scott Morrison pays the people of New Zealand to stay home when they want to go out. These avoided movements of New Zealanders getting out and about, and remember I'm talking CO2 here, has no effect on Australians spreading COVID-19 in our country. It's pure bullshit. These avoided emissions are cheap as chips because they're mostly low quality zombie style offsets. We have one earth that is not partitioned with massive walls stopping CO2 from traveling all over it. Emissions produced here end up here and everywhere. Absolute garbage which is sadly a thing, just like carbon capture and storage, also included in this third category. But I've detailed this technology previously and how most carbon capture and storage projects in the world are just gimmicks that governments and companies pretend actually work. If you want to learn more about this, please go and check out this video. But if you don't want to go and watch that video, here is my quick answer. Carbon capture and storage doesn't work. It distracts. They cost lots of money and they give that appearance of a company to actively be doing something when in fact they're not. But what did our government do at COP26? They once again had a fossil fuel delegation promoting carbon capture and storage projects, which for decades haven't worked or grossly underperformed. Fortunately, organisations like Compensate are spreading the actual truths around carbon credits, offsets and avoided emissions and call out different rules that exist in these different marketplaces and how that carbon offset in one country might mean a thing in another. And sadly, COP26 delivered not only a softening of language around coal, but also 200 million poor quality zombie credits, and they're going to be allowed into the new carbon market. Ozpol and fossil fuel companies be like, great, so we can keep building these, polluting and cause global warming, and say, hand on heart, we're net zero, we're carbon neutral. <laughs> The first COP meeting was 27 years ago and 2050 is just 29 years away. We're almost halfway there. And if you read and understand the science as found in these amazing reports like the UN's IPCC climate summation or the International Energy Agency's publications, you would know that our politicians are failing to read the room. They're failing to act on climate action policies and failing our children. These slogans of meet and beat our targets and technology not taxes, they're meaningless. The tech we support now, the money we invest in, and setting goals will affect how cooked or uncooked we'll all be. The Morrison government went to Glasgow with a pledge to reduce emissions by 26 to 28% of 2005 levels by 2030. But with energy being our major contributor of emissions at more than 50%, would it surprise you that we can meet and beat this pathetic figure by supporting 100% renewable energy by 2030? That would provide Australia with about 44.5% cut in carbon emissions, and is completely doable if they would instead spend $600 million of taxpayers' money on dispatchable battery storage not allowing for gas exploration in places where they shouldn't be doing it, and they should definitely be keeping underground. This is old tech. This is technology that requires taxes to support them. But like a broken record, and that we will meet and beat it, and that we will meet and beat it, and that we will meet and beat it. Another technology now supported by the Morrison government is electric vehicles, which is funny because there's two things. We don't have a problem with electric vehicles. And I'll tell you what, it's not going to, it's not going to tow your trailer, it's not going to tow your boat, it's not going to get you out to your fa favourite camping spot with your family. Bill Shorten wants to end the weekend when it comes to his policy on electric vehicles, where you've got Australians who, who love being out there in their four-wheel drives. He wants to say, see you later, to the SUV. It's a war on the weekend. And we are going to save their utes because we understand choice. No, I, I didn't ridicule those, that technology. That's good technology. Vehicle emissions in Australia are the second largest carbon emitter 
Can it be dramatically reduced? Yes, by going electric. And what is our fossil fuel loving politician doing? Bugger all really. Just like this drink. The future fuel and vehicle strategy is the Clayton's policy. It's got no substance and it's going to have zero impact. It turns out there might actually be something to this pseudo drink, I mean Model M. The Morrison government contracted McKinsey, a billion dollar multinational consultancy agency, and they were paid six million dollars by our boffins to produce an extremely weird document that has a solution to battle climate change with some sort of tech that is not known today. Yeah, we'll call that the Unicorn Climate Action Tool. Instead, what we got was modelling based upon carbon offsets, no new policies, and voluntary, non-binding actions. This modelling has some alarming choices. By 2050, the gas industry will be 13% higher. Coal will remain our predominant energy source for the next decade. Internal combustion engine cars will be the majority of the sales in 2040. And I don't even know what this type of weird vehicle type is. Super efficient? At burning stuff? Keeping motorists poor and tied to fossil fuel companies and bowsers when instead, or well, the Australian government could actually encourage people to buy electric vehicles and fill their cars up with like free electricity from solar or wind turbine if you've got one of those at your place. And in doing so, that's not only going to cut emissions, but it's also going to decrease costs to motorists because, you know, you can fill up for free of these things. So. Encouragingly, they see a 51% reduction in the coal sector, mainly due to other countries saying no thanks to our coal. But what I don't understand is that organisations like AMO, Academics and the Clean Energy Council have modelled our current trajectory in the energy market. And they see a better, cleaner future for Australia, but also one that is truly net zero and meets and beats the targets before 2035. This entire video is not an opinion piece, it's been thoroughly researched and cross-checked. If you'd like to go and review them, I've left a link to it in the description below. Plus, after this video has finished, please go and check out this video I did with Simon Holmes at Court and his modelling around energy future in Australia. So when Australia's current annual emissions are 494.2 megatons, this pathetic modelling by McKinsey, supported by the federal government, falls short by 215 megatons. This report is worrying. The premise 10% of it being realised at year 2050. That is 10 to 15 years too late. They've also modelled 15% of it on a magical unicorn who will address a good portion of our emissions. And they've relied upon carbon offsets, which as you now know, can be dubious at best. The Morrison government is placing a bad bet on our future. 25% of this modelling is composed of things that may never happen or have been repeatedly demonstrated to be rorts and scams. And please, do not be fooled folks. This is a Clayton's plan. It's a plan you have when you don't have a plan. It's too little and too late. With any luck, it could get us there Stephen Bradbury style. But when global temperatures of our world become inhospitable, like floods, drought, wildfires and more become the norm, and this guy says, it's okay, the world is burning and your love for fossil fuels is hurting us. This plan has no substance nor is it a true goal. What does Australia need? A true plan and not marketing slogans. One with a lot less fossil fuel dependence. This is the Australian way. One that goes beyond 50% emissions by 2030 and a true net zero before 2050. And that we will meet and beat it. With fossil fuel standards that improve our health and decrease costs to motorists. This is the Australian way. With a comprehensive electric vehicle policy and one that provides incentives to increase electric vehicle adoption. This is the Australian way. You see, Scotty, Australia is getting on with it without your pathetic pamphlet. With recent talk about an election looming, Australians are onto you and they're ready to vote. So whilst we do our bit, how about you do yours? In addition to those four suggestions, try these. Look to modelling done by government agencies and reduce harmful emissions from coal and gas by going to 100% renewable by 2030. This will reduce power bills for all and give you some creed around your economic credentials. 
introduce a carbon tax, electrify everything and support it, signal to industry and buyers that an internal combustion engine ban will happen in Australia by 2030, stop approving gas power plants, and whilst you're at it, no more gas fracking and digging stuff up. Do these things at a minimum and stop permitting these guys from dictating our policies and maybe, just maybe, we might reach a true net zero without your magical unicorn. That's the end of a long video and I do appreciate if you've watched it to now, so thank you. And I want to say a huge thanks to my patrons who also support this work. This has taken months in the making and every time I've gone to go shoot it and I've done a, well, probably kind of two takes on it really, um, the story keeps changing. Someone says something else. So as of this date, I put a line in the sand and I've said, that's it. I need to put this little puppy to bed. And just know that unfortunately, Australia's political climate history isn't very good. And right now, we need a lot more action in this space. So yeah, if you can do anything, think what you can do and do it, unlike these guys. Um, if you have enjoyed this video, please do consider giving me a subscribe, it's absolutely free. If you want to see behind the scenes, news, polls and stuff that I just can't show you here on YouTube, please do go check this out over on Patreon, where you can support me from as little as $2.50 per month and get all this and a lot more. And as per usual, you be good and you be green.